Hey, Pastor Brennan here. I just want to say thank you for viewing this video sermon. I hope that you're blessed. If you're tied into a local church and you're viewing this as just sort of extra teaching, that's awesome. I hope you really enjoy it and that you grow spiritually. If you're not tied into a local church, I just want to encourage you to come and maybe visit Crosspoint in person or check out another Christ-centered, gospel-proclaiming church in your area because we believe that everyone should experience the blessing of being tied into a local church. But I hope this video is an encouragement and that it helps you grow in your affections for Jesus Christ. Story. Jonah ran from God, was swallowed by a whale, cried out for help, and God saved him. But what if there's more to the story? What if this small book packs a bigger punch? When you read, I mean really read Jonah, the text cries out with questions. When the word of God came to Jonah, why did he run? Why do we? Why does God bring storms into our lives? Why, like Jonah, do our hearts melt when we receive God's mercy, but harden when our enemies do? At what point did Jonah's patriotism become spiritually toxic? Why does Jesus point to Jonah more than any other prophet? And how does Jonah's story point to Jesus' story, to our story? Let's open our Bibles and find out together. If you're able, please stand for the reading of the word. Scripture reading this morning is Jonah chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, you can find it on page 775 in the Bibles under the seats in front of you. All right. Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would bring due to them, and he did not do it. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Mark. How are we doing? I just want to say it is a profound blessing and privilege to be the pastor of Fellowship Cross Point. And I just want to thank you for your overwhelming generosity uh, to me and my family. So thank you so much. You know, one of the greatest revivals in all of church history happened in Pyongyang. That's the capital of what's now North Korea. And the backstory is quite interesting. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt negotiated a peace between the Russians and the Japanese to bring an end to that war. And part of that peace agreement, Teddy Roosevelt uh, recognized that Japan could have sovereignty over the Korean Peninsula. Teddy Roosevelt won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. And Korea lost its country. The Japanese occupied and oppressed Korea until 1945. The Japanese forced many Koreans uh, to be slave laborers. The Japanese burned a number of documents in an effort to eradicate Korea's history. They actually forbade Koreans from speaking Korean. And in all the public schools in Korea, Japanese was taught to children. And then later, tragically, hundreds of thousands were forced to serve as comfort women that is, sex slaves for the Japanese army during World War II. To this day, many Koreans have a deep-seated resentment, if not an outright animosity towards the Japanese people. 
That certainly was the case in the early 1900s. And then in January of 1907, William Blair, a Presbyterian preacher and missionary, he spoke to about 900 uh, Christian Korean men at a men's conference. And the primary push of his message to those men was repentance. He called upon them to turn away from their sin, to seek the face of God through the cross of Jesus Christ, to forsake their sin and ask forgiveness. But then William Blair pressed in on a very sensitive nerve. He called these 900 Korean men to repent of their ethnic hatred of the Japanese. You see, these Koreans, even though they were Christians, even though they knew the gospel and understood the gospel, it had not yet sunk deep into their hearts. They believed that they were morally and ethnically superior to their oppressors. So as William Blair proclaimed the gospel, he reminded these Korean men that outside of Jesus Christ, they were equally deserving of God's wrath. They were not morally superior. Outside of God's grace, outside of the gospel, they would spend eternity in hell. And it was only by God's grace, it was only through the work of Jesus Christ that these Korean men had become Christians. And then all of a sudden, something happened that only the Holy Spirit of God could truly explain. These Korean men, one by one, began to repent of their sin began to ask God for his forgiveness for their ethnic animosities. They would fall down on their knees, cry out to God through tears for forgiveness, one after another after another. Before they knew it, hundreds and hundreds of men were all praying, crying out to God in unison, asking that God would forgive their sin. This was the beginning of the great Pyongyang revival of 1907. And then something incredible happened as repentance was coming to God's people inside the church, gospel proclamation was empowered outside of the church. And in the next four years, over 80,000 Koreans came to Christ. People were traveling over 200 miles, walking to Pyongyang just to hear the gospel preached. It was an incredible work of grace. Just to give you a, a, a sense of the scale of this revival, the Methodist church in Korea doubled in size its membership in one year. And to this day, while Christians are forced underground in North Korea because it's a totalitarian state, in free South Korea, churches are thriving. The gospel is on the move. And South Korean Christians today per capita are sending more missionaries around the world than any other country. That's the lasting work of this incredible revival. Throughout history, God has a way of grabbing hold of people groups and bringing large numbers of people to Christ. But there's a pattern when you study revivals. It always begins with the gospel being proclaimed inside of the church. When Christians repent of their sin and look to Christ. And as the church is repenting of their sin, the power of the Holy Spirit overflows outside of the walls of the church where people who do not yet know Christ are drawn to hear the gospel and more and more people come to Christ and the church explodes. This is the pattern of revivals throughout history. And as we look at today's text, we're gonna see that Jonah is gonna go to Nineveh and he's gonna proclaim the judgment of God to his ethnic enemies. And by the work of the Holy Spirit, 120,000 Ninevites, the entire population of the city, is going to repent. They're going to turn away from their sin. And here's the lesson from today's text. When sinners repent, God relents. When sinners repent of their sin, God relents of his judgment. That was true 2,800 years ago in Nineveh and it's still true today. Let's pray. Lord God of the universe, you are indeed awesome. We are in awe of your glory, your majesty, your eternal power, but also your mercy, your grace, and your love. 
Lord, the mass repentance of these evil Assyrians is by far the greatest miracle in a book of miracles. So Lord, would you remind us that ultimately you are the one through the power of your Holy Spirit who grants repentance and you grant it by your grace. So Lord, would you pour out through the power of your spirit, would you pour out a spirit of repentance among your people, among the believers here today, that the weight of our sin would weigh so heavily on our hearts that we would buckle under the weight of that sin. We would turn away from it. We would repent, forsake our sin, and once again, look to the cross of Jesus Christ. You tell us, Lord, that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Would you bring repentance to your people today? But don't stop there. May the power of the Holy Spirit overflow to every not yet believer here in this room that they would recognize that they are under the judgment of God for their sin and they would embrace the hope of the gospel. They would embrace the hope of Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Well, hey, we're hitting the home stretch of our series here in the book of Jonah. And next Sunday, we're going to culminate our study as we walk through chapter 4. If you were here last week, then you know that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, right? He was down in the belly of the whale, and he believed that that, that belly was going to be his tomb. But by God's grace, it became a womb. It became a place that preserved his life. And then God ordered that whale to spit Jonah out back on dry land and God was giving Jonah a second chance to obey the word of the Lord. Now remember, it was a hard word to obey. God was calling Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital of the evil Assyrian empire, the ethnic enemies of Israel and proclaim both the judgment and mercy of God. Now Jonah has a second chance to proclaim this message. And the first part of the message Jonah loves I mean, Jonah's all about proclaiming God's judgment on his enemies. It's the whole mercy part of the message that Jonah's having a hard time with. That's a tough one. Jonah has not yet repented of his ethnic animosity. Now, real quickly, uh, I'm going to let you know that next Sunday, we're going to culminate our series with one last Q&A. So I'm going to ask you to actually save your questions today. If you have any questions from today's sermon in chapter 3, just go ahead and write them down, put a note in your phone. And then next Sunday, after each of the services, we'll have a culminating question and answer session right over there in the conference room. And I'll look forward to that time with you. All right, we are ready to dive into today's text. We're in Jonah chapter three. We're gonna go ahead and pick up in verse one. Do me a favor, if you don't have a Bible with you, go ahead and reach underneath the seat in front of you and grab one of these books. If you're new to Christianity, this is the Bible. I know it sounds crazy, but it is the inspired word of God. And in a culture that is categorically against the very idea of absolute truth, the Bible proudly stands as the unstoppable, indomitable heavyweight champion of truth. And be careful as you open up this book because it is spiritual dynamite. It has the power to explode in our hearts at any time and radically transform us with the love of Jesus Christ. Here we go. Let's get after it. This is God's word to you. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. So once again, after three days in the belly of that whale, Jonah has a second chance to obey the word of the Lord. Now there's a great reminder here, right at the beginning of chapter three, for anyone who who teaches or preaches the word of God. We don't proclaim our opinions. We don't proclaim our political preferences. And we don't preach our personal vendettas. If you teach or preach the word of God, you are restricted to the message of God that is in the Bible. So if you ever roll into a church on a Sunday and the pastor is preaching from something other than the Bible, you got to roll right on out. Because at the end of the day, you shouldn't care about anyone's opinions. You should care about the truth of God. And the message of this book is centered on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing now in verse three, look at the text. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breath. Nineveh, if you remember, is the modern city of Mosul, Iraq. And Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was the great first empire of all the empires in the Bible. And it lasted for over 300 years. 
hundred years. If you look at the map there, you can see it covered all the way from Iraq, as far west as Egypt, as far north as Turkey. I mean, this was an incredible empire. And if you recall from earlier in the series, the Assyrian empire had a reputation for being the most ruthless, tenacious, and downright evil empire, maybe, that has ever existed. Shalmaneser III, one of the emperors, became known, he was infamous, that when they conquered their enemies on the battlefield, they would take great pride in burning entire cities to the ground. And when they conquered an enemy, they would cut off their legs, they would cut off their left arms, as you can see on this stone relief panel that was recovered in modern Mosul, Iraq, but they would leave their enemy's right arms, their right hands, so that they could reach out and shake the hands of their dying enemies in mockery. That's the type of people we're dealing with in Assyria, in Nineveh, the capital. And at this point, the Ninevites, the Assyrians are at the peak of their power. And evidence of that is demonstrated that Israel pays an annual tribute to Assyria. They give them money, bribery money, to avoid an Assyrian invasion. That's the circumstances here in the book of Jonah. But so interesting because God was beginning to plow the soil of Nineveh in the years and months leading up to Jonah's arrival. Assyrian records reveal that there was a full solar eclipse before Jonah arrived to preach this sermon. There was also two different plagues that decimated the city as well as a great famine. And it destroyed much of Nineveh's population. There were also tremendous revolts that were happening, pervasive revolts throughout Nineveh that were really uh, bringing great um, chaos to the social order in Nineveh. And the Ninevites saw these signs as bad omens. They believed that the gods were upset with them and were gonna bring judgment on them. And the most instrumental god for the Assyrians, the one they feared the most, was the god Dagon. And are you ready for this? Dagon was a god who was half fish, half man. And the legend goes in Assyria that this man was brought up from the belly of a fish. Isn't that interesting? So now Jonah comes rolling into town. They've had the eclipses, they've had the plagues, they've had the revolts. They're now spiritually sensitive. They're afraid of the gods. And Jonah comes and says, y'all ain't gonna believe this but the God of Israel told me to come preach to you. I said no the first time. I was swallowed by a whale. He spit me back out on dry land and here I am to proclaim a message. Now that heads up from Jonah (laughs) would have particular resonance in an Assyrian culture that is deathly afraid of Dagon, the fish god. Now just think about God's sovereignty. He was preparing the Ninevites sociologically and spiritually. He was preparing them to hear this message from Jonah. Take a look at verse four. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now it's so interesting, so many scholars will go out of their way to find reasons in the Bible to throw out the veracity of the entire Bible. So look at the book of Jonah, they laugh at the whale, right? They laugh at these supernatural claims, and then they say, it's not even historically accurate. There's no city in the ancient world that would require a three days journey to get across it. You know what's amazing? Ancient Near Eastern historians are very quick to push back and say, if you know anything about the ancient world, a city did not just refer to what was behind the outer walls of a city. When you refer to a city, you're referring to not only the city proper, but the urban sprawl, the suburbs, and the farming communities that are in that region. It makes perfect historical sense to say that Assyria was a three days journey to get across it. It's almost as if they want the Bible to be untrue. Isn't that interesting? The text says that Jonah went only one day's journey before he preached this sermon, before he preached this message. And it's almost as if the author is trying to allude to the fact that Jonah is not super excited about this task. He's not going all the way into the heart of the city, but rather he's proclaiming this message out on the periphery of the city. But we're gonna see that God makes sure that the message gets to the heart of the city. But you know what? One thing is clear. Jonah's sermon was profoundly concise. It was very, very short. I mean, just look at the text. 
40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In the original Hebrew, it's even fewer words. It's only five words, a five word sermon. Now I know what some of you are thinking right now and you should repent of your sin. But here we go, all joking aside, um, maybe this was just a summary of the sermon, okay? But what's really, really clear is that Jonah is proclaiming God's judgment on Nineveh. That's unmistakably clear here. Jonah is saying the wrath of God is coming. You are an evil, pervasively violent people. You're not only cruel and sadistic towards your enemies, but there's tremendous injustice and violence even among your own people. You're horrible to one another. God is watching and God is angry. And God's judgment is coming on Nineveh. You know, it's sort of interesting as you read chapter three, you get the feeling that Jonah was really excited to preach this sermon. I get to proclaim God's judgment on my sworn enemies. Sounds great. You get the feeling that Jonah was preaching the judgment of God with great joy. I mean, this was just awesome. And if you look at it carefully in the sermon, he doesn't say 40 days in Nineveh might be overthrown. He says 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. He can't wait. He wants to see bolts of lightning coming down to destroy the city. Jonah preached judgment with joy. He wanted to see God eviscerate this city. To any aspiring preachers here in the room, we are called to preach the full counsel of God's word. And if you preach the full counsel of God's word, it includes God's judgment on sinners. But hear me, we preach it with tears, not joy. We preach God's judgment with tears, pleading for people to repent. We don't preach it with joy, hoping that they will be judged. You know, I was thinking this week, what if the Ninevites responded to Jonah's sermon with the classic postmodern perspective? Like what if Jonah rolls into town, he says, 40 days and God's judgment is coming on this city for your evil ways. What if they responded like this? Hey, Jonah, who are you? What right do you have to tell us that we're wrong? Jonah, get with it, man. Don't you know that every culture, even every individual can determine what is right or wrong for himself or herself? Jonah, that is so arrogant. Who do you think you are? Why do you, Jonah, get to determine the standards of justice? Why do you get to define what is permissible and what is not permissible? Jonah, who do you think you are? You know, maybe you are not yet a believer in Jesus, but you're open to the message of Christianity. I just want to say, I really admire your intellectual curiosity, your willingness to come and give Christianity a hearing. And I wonder if maybe, just maybe, you can identify with those questions. I mean, how is it that Christians get to claim that their way is right and the other religions are wrong? How is it that Christians can say that, that there's clear, there's clear right and wrong? I mean, who are you to say that? Everyone should be able to decide for themselves. If that's where you're coming from, just give me a minute here. You know, we all, Christian and not yet Christian, we all want to live in a more just society. We want to see people treated well. We want to see justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. But here's the thing. Who gets to define justice? Who gets to determine what's an unjust law and what is a just law? I think we can agree that we all need a standard of justice. We need to look at something, a standard, and by that standard, we can determine right from wrong, just from unjust. You know, recently my wife, Kathleen, asked me to wallpaper our bathroom. Extremely intimidated by this. I've never wallpapered anything before, so what did I do? I went on YouTube and watched some DIY videos, right? That's what you do. I watched three different videos. These are all experts at wallpapering. I mean, these guys got hundreds of thousands of, of uh, views on their, on their videos. These guys know what they're doing. And I remember the first video I watched, the woman, she was an expert. She said, if you don't hear anything else, just hear this before you turn off the video. Do not use the seam between the wall and the ceiling. Do not use that as your plumb line. <laughs> 
do not hang your wallpaper according to the line between the ceiling and the wall. And she explained that it's always crooked. Every single time it's crooked. And if you use that as the standard of straightness, then your wallpaper is going to be crooked. She explained that when you build a house, when you frame out a house and then you drywall a house and then the house inevitably begins to settle on the foundation, it's always crooked. That line, that seam where the ceiling meets the wall is always crooked. And she said, you have to use a plumb line. You have to use a level to hang your wallpaper. And then she demonstrated, you put the level on the wall, you find just the perfect leveled spot and then you draw a line with a pencil and that becomes your mark. That's how you hang your first piece of wallpaper. And it ensures that all the wallpaper will be straight. One of the videos, the guy said something like this. He said, a level never lies. I thought that was a great line. A level never lies. We need a level in order to hang wallpaper straight. And here we go. The same is true when it comes to navigating issues of justice in our society. How do we know if a law is just or unjust? We need a supernatural plumb line, a supernatural standard of right and wrong. And you know what that standard is? It's the book. God has given us his word. This is our supernatural level. This is how we can discern whether something is right or something is wrong. Jonah could not roll into Nineveh and say, according to my cultural standards, you are evil. There's no authority in that. But Jonah, a prophet of God, got a word of God. And God said, according to my supernatural standards, your ways are wicked. They are evil. Your violent ways must stop or I'm going to judge this city. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963 intentionally violated segregation laws in Birmingham, Alabama. He was criticized greatly He was criticized by other Christians. And if you know anything about Martin Luther King, he did not respond by saying, well, listen, I looked inside my heart and I determined what is right and wrong. And that law of segregation is wrong according to my personal morality. That's not what he said. Martin Luther King said, the only way we know if a law is just or unjust is if we measure it by the moral law of God. He said, if a human law squares with the law of God in the Bible, then it is a just law. And if it doesn't square with the Bible, then it is an unjust law and I have a moral responsibility not to follow it. If you know anything about Martin Luther King, he didn't stand up in Washington, D.C. in the I Have a Dream speech. He didn't stand up and say, he didn't stand up and start quoting modern philosophers. He didn't stand up and say, I looked inside my heart and I found out what is true. He stood up and said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He was quoting the Bible. He was quoting the Bible. We need a supernatural standard, not our own standards. We don't look inside our hearts to determine what is right and wrong. We look to the supernatural level, the standard, and it's God and his word. Take a look at verse 5. Jonah has proclaimed this message of judgment. Let's see how Nineveh responds. Verse five. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he proclaimed, he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Even though Jonah preached this message on the periphery of the city, God sovereignly made sure that it got to the heart of the city, that it got to the heart of the king of Nineveh himself. And he takes off his royal robe and he puts on sackcloth and he sat in ashes and called for a kingdom-wide fast. 
Now, sometimes you get to a passage like this, and as postmodern readers of Scripture, it's an ancient text, we have to blow off the dust of antiquity a little bit. So, for example, what's fasting all about? Why are they fasting in the ancient world and still today? When we choose to fast from eating, when we have a fast, we take our attention off food preparation and eating, and we focus our attention on God. In the ancient world, to sit in ashes was a sign that you were experiencing severe mourning. Specifically, you were mourning, grieving your sin. And then finally, sackcloth. Sackcloth is like burlap. Imagine the most uncomfortable clothes you have ever worn in your life. And then imagine wearing them intentionally. That's sackcloth. And by being physically uncomfortable by this sackcloth material, it was a physical manifestation of the spiritual reality that you were experiencing. You were grieving your sin, turning away from it, repenting and crying out to God for forgiveness. This is happening in Nineveh among Assyrians, some of the most evil people who have ever existed. If you look at verses eight and nine, the Hebrew word shub is repeated three times in just two verses. Three times in just two verses. And it points to the heart of this text. Now the Hebrew word shub, it means literally to turn. It means to go back or it means to do a 180, turn around and head in the opposite direction. That's what shub means. In the context of the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew shub is the word they use for repentance. For repentance. Recognizing that you're heading in the wrong direction, experiencing conviction of sin, turning around and going in the opposite direction back towards God. That's what it means to shub. And these Ninevites, some of the most violent, wicked people who have ever existed, they're repenting of their sins, recognizing and owning their guilt before God, and then crying out in prayer, asking the God of Israel, asking God to have mercy upon them and not burn their city to the ground. Isn't that incredible? While the text doesn't indicate it explicitly, we can appropriately infer that these Ninevites must have known something of the mercy of God. How would they have any hope whatsoever that God might relent? And you know, I'm wondering, maybe, just maybe, I'm wondering if Jonah's sermon went something like this. He showed up and he said, ha, 40 days and this city's gonna be overthrown. God is angry with your sin. He's angry with your violent ways and he's gonna burn this city to the ground. But um, if you repent of your sin, <laughs> if you take ownership over the bad things that you've done, if you uh, cry out to God for mercy, he might extend forgiveness. You know, like the judgment part, he's all in. He's a little hesitant, though, when it comes to the whole mercy thing, right? I don't know, maybe it went down that way, I'm not sure. Or maybe, just maybe, Jonah preached the sermon on judgment. That was it. He just preached judgment. But then at the post-sermon Q&A in the conference room, Jonah was, you know, getting peppered with questions and all of a sudden he kind of had to tell them a little bit about the mercy of God. I don't know how it went down, but I think it's clear in the text that these Ninevites had some idea that the God of Israel, oh, if you turn away from your sin, if you repent, then he might relent. He might extend mercy to those who ask for it. Either way, these people knew something about the mercy of God. Now look at verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. My friends, the lesson of Jonah 3 is clear. When sinners repent, God relents. When sinners repent, when they turn away from their sin, God relents from judgment. That is clear in the text. But where does, this, where does this desire for repentance come from? Like, how do you get to a place in your heart where you're ready to turn away from your sin and turn back to God? Do you have to kind of like dig deep down inside and pull it out? Where does this idea of repentance, where does this feeling come from? 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, Paul reminds Timothy that repentance is granted by God. It is the Holy Spirit of God that grants repentance. Unless God intervenes, unless his Holy Spirit begins to work on the heart of a human being, they will continue headlong in their sin. They will not repent. They will not turn away. They will not seek the forgiveness of God unless God in his grace and mercy moves on the heart of a human being through the power of his Holy Spirit. You know, it's really fascinating to hear different commentators, professional scholars who are experts in Jonah, to hear them try to make sense of what happened in Jonah chapter three. There are some well-intentioned evangelical scholars. They look at this text. They look at the incredible repentance that took place among the Ninevites and they say, Jonah must have preached salvation by God's grace through faith alone. Jonah preached the gospel and 120,000 Ninevites came to faith in the God of Israel. Well, the text certainly doesn't say that. We have no indication that they're making sacrifices to God, that they're forsaking their false gods, turning away from their idols. They didn't get everyone together and have a huge um, circumcision party, right? So, I mean, there's nothing in the text that would blatantly tell us that they have all come to faith, truly faith, in the covenant God of Israel, in Yahweh. The way it's specified, remember in chapter one, the sailors cried out to Yahweh. They made vows and sacrifices to Yahweh, the covenant name of God of Israel. So that'd be reading a lot into the text to say that they've all truly come to faith in Jesus Christ. The text is kind of quiet on that. But on the other end of the intellectual spectrum, there are those who read this text and they say, despite the fact that Jonah preached a sermon that was clearly focused on judgment, they just focus in on how social justice was brought about in the city of Nineveh. See, this is great. We just gotta be like Jonah. We gotta go into the city. We gotta become social workers. And if we make sure that we lift up the poor and we make sure that we speak out against any violence or injustice, that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. Forget about the blood of Christ. Forget about judgment. Forget about sin and death and hell. We just have to work towards social justice. The problem with that perspective that's not what the text is saying. It's not what the text is saying. So what does the text say? We see that there's radical repentance among some of the most evil people who ever lived. And what was the catalyst for that repentance? A sermon about the judgment of God. So you have the judgment of God being preached and you have social justice being pursued as a result. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that fascinating? But let me tell you what is incredibly sad. Those preachers who love to preach about the judgment of God, they often forget to preach about how God's people should be seeking justice. And those who love to preach about social justice, they somehow never get around to preaching about the judgment of Almighty God. Brothers and sisters, the Bible calls for us to do both. It calls for us to do both. Remember that great revival, the Pyongyang revival of 1907? That's the church that William Blair, that Presbyterian missionary preached in at that men's conference. 900 men came under conviction of the Holy Spirit, repented of their ethnic animosity towards the Japanese and cried out to God, for forgiveness, one after another, after another. It was an incredible movement of the Holy Spirit. Eventually, hundreds and hundreds of Korean Christian men were all praying in unison. It was an outpouring of prayer. One missionary describes it like this, quote, not confusion, but a vast harmony of sound and spirit, a mingling together of souls moved by an irresistible impulse of prayer. The prayer sounded to me like the falling of many waters, an ocean of prayer beating against God's throne. It was not many, but one, born of one spirit, lifted to one father above, just as on the day of Pentecost. God is not always in the whirlwind, neither does he always speak in a still small voice. He came to us in Pyongyang that night with the sound of weeping. 
As the prayer continued, a spirit of heaviness and sorrow for sin came down upon the audience. Over on one side, someone began to weep, and in a moment, the whole audience was weeping. Man after man would rise, confess his sins, break down and weep, then throw himself to the floor and beat the floor with his fists in perfect agony of conviction. My own cook tried to make a confession, broke down in the midst of it and cried to me across the room, pastor, tell me, is there any hope for me? Can I be forgiven? And then threw himself to the floor and wept and wept, end quote. If you are not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I wonder if maybe you can identify with that Korean cook. Because when you look into the rearview mirror of your life, you are ashamed by the things you have done. You're paralyzed by a sense of guilt. And maybe you two are wondering, is there any hope for me? Can God forgive me for the things that I've done, for the things that I am doing? Hear me. If you repent, if you turn away from your sin, God will relent from judging you. Now the question on your heart should be this, how can this be? How can a God of righteousness a God of justice, a God of divine wrath. How can he relent and not pour out judgment on me for my sin? Because of the gospel. And here's the gospel. Because God the Father did not relent, but rather poured out his judgment on his son Jesus Christ on the cross. Because of that, that same God can relent and not pour out his judgment on you. If you repent, Turn away from your sin and trust Jesus as your one and only Savior and embrace him as the Lord over your life. Because God did not relent in judging his son. If you trust his son Jesus, he will relent and not judge you. Why? Because your sin was already judged on Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how. That's the hope of the gospel. That's all we have, brothers and sisters. Are you gonna to go to God one day and say, God, forgive me for my sin because I didn't cheat on my taxes. God, forgive me of my sin because I finally stopped using four letter words. It doesn't work that way. The righteous judge of the universe will only forsake his judgment upon you if you believe that he's already judged Jesus for your sin. That's the hope of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to his religious enemies, the religious leaders of Israel, the very people who are going to make sure that Jesus is crucified on the cross. And he looks them square in the eye and he tells them that judgment is coming for them. These are the most religious people you will ever meet in your life. And Jesus says, judgment is coming for you. And then he specifies in verse 41, he says, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is the perfect prophet. Jesus is the greater Jonah. Jonah preached a lame sermon, and 120,000 people came to, came to repentance through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is God. He is proclaimed forever that sin is forgiven through the cross, that because of his sacrifice for us, we can be forgiven if we turn away from our sin to the not yet believer. Today is the day of salvation. Maybe you've heard the gospel many, many times, but it's always remained on the periphery of your heart. If God is bringing it to the center of your heart this morning and you feel the weight of your sin, then trust Jesus today, not tomorrow, today. Today is the day of salvation. And to the believers here, to my brothers and sisters in Christ, your sin has been forgiven. You are now a child of God because Christ ransomed you. 
You are a child of God. You are no longer defined by your sin. God no longer holds your sin against you. But if you're honest with yourself, you know that there's still sin deep in that heart, right? Even though we strive to walk in obedience, it still comes out, doesn't it? That sin still comes out. Hear me, brother or sister in Christ. The posture of the Christian life is the posture of repentance. We continually take out the garbage in our life through repentance. We bring it to the curb. We forsake it and we say, Jesus, take it away. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I wonder, brother or sister in Christ, if William Blair, that great missionary preacher, were to visit our churches today and look in the hearts of Christians today, what would he tell us we need to repent of? He told those Koreans that they need to repent of their ethnic animosity towards their Japanese oppressors. He reminded them that outside of Christ, they were just as guilty before an almighty God. I wonder if William Blair wouldn't say to many Christians today who on the eve of this election are filled with animosity towards their political enemies and are ready to go to war in their hearts if things don't go their way. If that's you today, God is calling you to repent. He's calling you to repent, to recognize that because you might have a better moral compass than the other side, that doesn't mean you are worthy of forgiveness. It doesn't mean that you are worthy of God's mercy or God's grace. Forsake your animosity. Confess it to God. I'm gonna pray, and then Amit, Elder Amit Lanakar is gonna lead us in communion. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you have preserved this testimony of this great revival in Nineveh. And Lord, we are reminded that repentance begins in the church. Holy Spirit, would you bring repentance to our hearts this morning? Let our sin weigh so heavily that we can't help but forsake it and turn to you. Let it begin in the heart of the believer and overflow to the not yet believers so that they might turn from their sin and find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name, amen.